Hi everybody, I'm Fabio Mercurio of Bloomberg. I'm here at Global Derivatives 2013 with uh, uh, Professor John Hall of the uh, University of Toronto. Of course, Professor John Hall doesn't need any introduction and uh, we all know like his several papers on uh, stochastic relativity modeling, interest rate uh, modeling, credit risk. I mean, he has an extensive production and uh, seminal papers. Uh, but today we are here to uh, discuss about um, some of his re recent work which has actually triggered a lot of attention in the, in the market. He, he wrote uh, a short article for his magazine last year on uh, fund evaluation adjustments for derivatives. And uh, as he said, as I said before, I mean, this article actually um, inspired a lot of people, both from academia and the market, to, uh, to reply and to give their own uh, uh, comments and ideas. So I'm here today to ask um, uh, John to briefly summarize his views on uh, fund evaluation adjustments and uh, maybe uh, describe the whole process from his first article to the latest one and maybe also to reply to some of the criticism he got you know uh, after the first publication well thanks Fabio it's, 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 it's nice to be here and be interviewed by you yeah it, of all the research that I've done uh, the stuff on funding value adjustment has really been different because there's there's um, it, it, it sort of produces immediate response from the industry. You know, I was invited to uh, write this article for Risk Magazine. Here. This was the 25th anniversary issue of Risk Magazine, and uh, I did that in, it was a joint article with Alan White, uh, back in July last year. And almost immediately, I started getting emails from people, and there were two sorts of emails. Well, there were the emails that said, you're crazy. This is, you know, like some of the other stuff you've done, but this, you've got it all wrong. Uh, we've got to have a funding value adjustment for this sort of thing, this sort of thing. Because wh what, the, what the Risk Magazine article said was that from a theoretical point of view, the funding value adjustment makes no sense. And uh, gave all the reasons why the funding value adjustment makes no sense. So there were uh, roughly two-thirds of the people who, who wrote to us said, uh, you, you've got it all wrong. And then one-third said, yeah, actually, I like what you said. It makes a lot of sense, and I'm really glad you've said it. And the real issue here is that from a theoretical point of view, you should never make a funding value adjustment. Because when you value an investment, whether it's an investment in derivatives or an investment in anything else, it's the risk of that investment that's important, not how you fund it. I mean, this is one of the things we teach students in, 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 in Finance 101, uh, you know, that when you value an investment, always look at the risk of the investment, don't look at how you fund it. So, so that was the sort of thing that we said in that Risk Magazine article, and we pointed out that, in fact, if, you, um, if you've got an average funding cost of LIBOR plus 200 basis points, but you invest in relatively low-risk investments, then your funding cost will come down. So incrementally, your funding cost corresponds to the riskiness of the investment that you're investing in. And there are a few other arguments there as well. So that was where we came from, it, and uh, more recently I've sort of looked more at, you know, why we're having this debate. What, did it, what is it about the, um, the finance industry that makes everybody want to make this funding value adjustment? And that's what I've been talking about at this conference, because it's really the way in which traders, the performance measure of traders is assessed, that, um, you know, they... Basically, they're, they're assessed on a return on capital basis, and the cost is the average funding, the cost that's charged to the trader is the average funding cost of the financial institution. So, if you tell the trader that we're going to charge you the average funding cost, whatever you do, we'll charge you the average funding cost for the funds you use, or we'll credit you with the average funding cost for the funds you use up, then the trader is going to respond accordingly, and that's what's happening. And so the, tra the trader is responding to the incentives that the trader is given. So I would argue there's actually potentially two models out there. There's the model that the trader wants to use because of the incentives that the trader's given. And then there's the, um, the fair value, which the accountants try and calculate, which may well be different from the, the value that the traders have. Maybe there are even more models because, uh, you know, maybe the same thing can be valued also differently by the risk manager, I don't know, like, and not all the accountants. But uh, let, let, let me ask you this, and uh, um, so 
What's the uh, substantial difference? Because, okay, if there is a market, maybe, uh, maybe the trader would like to calibrate their own models to market prices more than maybe, you know, some market parameter like implied bulk correlation, or whatever. And if there is no market, then the accountant may have some issue defining the fair value because the fair value is something theoretical, but there is no fair value because you have to value some contract which is really bespoke, so there is no market for it. Well, good point. I mean, I, I, I think most of the time in derivatives, there's a, there's, a, there's a market for something that's fairly similar to what you're trading. Most of the time, it's, uh, you know, you may not be able to value, you may, be, may not be able to see in the market the price of exactly what you're trading, but you can see the prices of things that are similar to what you're trading, and you can use your model to, to uh, basically as an interpolation tool. Um, what I would argue is that there is only one market price. Different market participants will have their own prices. Some will have high funding costs and may have, if, if it's a derivative that's going to use up funding, they'll, you know, they, may, they may have a, a high price and other traders will have a low price for the same instrument. So I'm not saying everybody's got to have the same private valuation for the derivative, but there's only going to be one value in the market that sort of clears um, clears the market at any given time. It's what will balance the supply and demand. So I, I would argue that different, you know, as far as the private value is concerned, different financial institutions will have different private values. Uh, the valuations of high funding cost financial institutions will be different from the valuations of low funding cost financial institutions. But then I would also argue there's only, there's only one fair market value, which you say is some sort of average of all those fair uh, all those private values, and so therefore the private value doesn't necessarily agree with the fair market value. I see your point, but still have some difficulty uh, thinking about some practical situation when, uh, uh, for example, the market is one-sided. So, uh, so maybe the whole street is selling one type of options, and those options are bought by retail clients, for example. So clients that are not that sophisticated to uh, to negotiate the price, but actually they basically take the price that is given to them. So in that case, what's your definition of fair price? Well, you're saying the clients don't shop around. They just take whatever price a particular financial institution gives them. Then they're not being very sensible. I mean, they should they should get prices from several different financial institutions. And if they're buying, the lowest price that they, they get offered is the market price. Um, and, you know, all the higher price, uh, you know, that, that is the price that should clear the market. I'm not saying everything always works that efficiently, but in principle, that's what happens. I mean, just as when I'm buying a car, I could go around to several different dealers, and the market price is the best offer I get from all the dealers. And the car. You know, there's, there's, that, that is the price that should clear the market. Right. Uh, I have another question, which maybe is the last because we're running out of time, and uh, is uh, regarding uh, the expected rate of return of investments like uh, uh, risky bonds. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so basically, you are saying that the expected rate of return is the risk free rate, and uh, uh, but this is. Um, a major consequence of the assumption that, in fact, upon default um, of the counterparty, there is actually a gain that is uh, um, made by the issuer because you save that money. But if you default, your shareholders are actually seeing no profit at all. So how can you uh, use that, say, fake profit you are making upon default um, as an argument to saying that on average the expected rate of return on your on your bond is actually the risk-free rate. Yeah, this is the DVA argument. Is, is, is DVA real because in circumstances where you make this gain from defaulting, actually your shareholders are doing really badly because your, right. your company is going under. But I, you know, I think that we've, I mean, we've accepted a DVA on the derivatives that we may default on the derivatives. And you know, that's, that's what, you know, that's what, actually Alan White and I call that DVA1, DVA the one, yeah. possibility of de defaulting on the derivatives. And then you can say, well, also, also we've got a DVA on the stuff that's used to fund the derivatives, which we call DVA2. So yeah, in that original 
RIS, I mean, the, the original RISC magazine article was giving all the theoretical arguments, and that was one of the theoretical arguments we used, that if, if you say you're, the, risk, the premium over the risk-free rate that you pay on risky debt is, um, is all to compensate um, the debt holders for the fact that you might default, then you can say, well, actually, when you, the expected uh, return that you will provide the debt holders with is the promised return minus <coughs> their their CVA, if you like, their mm -hmm. their cost that you might default, and uh, the cost that you might default. If we ignore the fact that some of that uh, risk premium is actually liquidity and so on, if we say right. it's all, then 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 I would argue that really on an expected value basis. You are paying the risk-free rate to your, you know, to, to, to your bondholders. Okay. Thank you, John. It was really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Nice talking to you, Fabio.